Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last week, an F-22 shot a Chinese balloon out of the sky at 65,000 feet using a Sidewinder missile. But much was said about how this balloon was operating at altitudes above those accessible to the majority of aircraft. The F-22 is well equipped for this kind of high altitude interception with a pair of jet engines which have thrust vectoring providing both thrust and control. This was probably the highest altitude air-to-air -air kill in history, assuming that you do not count the F-15 which shot a satellite out of orbit. And I say probably because there's always a chance that there's some secret stuff that we've not heard about or stuff that wasn't logged as a record at the time. So the F-22's service ceiling had previously been reported by official sources at above 50,000 feet. And this engagement showed that it was operating around 60,000 feet. We don't know if that is the absolute ceiling, though. I thought it would be interesting to discuss the limits on aircraft altitudes. You know, the physics which set these ceilings and the specialized aircraft which are able to go far above and beyond the flight levels that most of humanity is limited to. So... Aircraft, by definition, use air to fly. And I say air, but since we do have a helicopter flying on Mars and we're building a helicopter for Titan, we should probably be clear that aerodynamics actually applies to any gas, regardless of composition, whether it is air or not. Aircraft use this air in two ways. Firstly, the airflow over aerodynamic surfaces is used to generate lift, allowing the aircraft to counteract the pull of gravity and take to the skies. Second, most aircraft use engines which push against the atmosphere to make them move fast enough so that the wings work. Now, there are exceptions to both of these. You can generate all the lift you need from an engine uh, so that you don't need to have any wings at all. You don't need to worry about the airflow. Helicopters, Harrier jump jets, right? And that drone that you got for Christmas, they all do this. And then, of course, on the other side, you have unpowered gliders, which just exploit the dynamics of the Earth's atmosphere to ride thermals and updrafts to stay aloft without the need for engines. Now, as you ascend through the atmosphere, the air density decreases. The wings become less effective at generating lift at the same airspeed. The air-breathing engine uh, has less air to work with, and it will lose thrust and power, and these effects will place practical limits on how high aircraft can fly. The surface ceiling of an aircraft is generally defined as the altitude at which an aircraft can still climb at 100 feet per minute. So, aircraft have a surface ceiling, but they can actually go beyond this, you know, to a point where full power cannot generate any further climb, but as a pilot, you need to appreciate that it takes a long time to climb at that rate and running an engine at full climb power in thin air may not be a good idea. The record for the highest altitude achieved by a helicopter is 12,442 meters or 48,820 feet by a guy called Jean Boulet. And that flight ended when the engine flamed out due to lack of air, so it also became the record for the longest auto-rotation descent and landing by a helicopter. So, wings generate lift based upon the airflow over them, and as the density drops, the wing generates less, less lift. So you need to move the wing faster through the air to generate the same amount of lift. And you might think that the pilot then has to sort of consciously increase the speed as they climb higher to maintain lift. But as far as a pilot is concerned, they don't actually see any change on their basic airspeed indicator because the airspeed indicator shows something called indicated airspeed. I mean, duh. This is different from the true airspeed, the actual speed through the air. So on aircraft, indicated airspeed is measured by a pressure system. And what it's measuring is the pressure difference between the static air pressure from all around and the ram air pressure generated by moving a probe through the air, like a mini air intake. So this probe is called the pitot tube and it points forward into the airstream and as the air entering this, it generates a higher pressure than the static uh, pressure. So both of these pressures are fed into an instrument which you know, puts them into a set of bellows connected by a mechanical linkage and that drives a needle on the airspeed indicator. So as the air density drops, you need to increase the true airspeed to get the same pressure difference and therefore the same indicated airspeed. And well, look, 
While this might seem not ideal, right, while it might seem much better to get your true airspeed, there's a real beauty in this relationship because this change mirrors the change in wing performance. So a plane which stalls at 70 knots indicated airspeed at sea level will generally stall at 70 knots indicated airspeed at 10,000 feet, even though by that point its true airspeed is actually 82 knots. Generally, however, you're not climbing at stall speed, by the way. There is a best rate of climb in your manuals, which where you are generally looking where the lift to drag ratio peaks and you can get the most performance out of your engine. So anyway, the, the lift and drag follow the same kind of relationship as the, the indicated airspeed. So flying at certain indicated airspeed requires approximately the same thrust from the engine, regardless of altitude. But then, of course, the engines suffer from the altitude and lack of air, which means that most small planes like the Cirrus that I fly have their altitude limited by the engine losing thrust as the air density drops, rather than, say, the wings losing lift. Firstly, the engine is taking air in from the atmosphere at ambient pressure, right, to go into the cylinders and burn the fuel, so the engine gets less powerful from that. And to compound that, as the propeller generates thrust by moving through the air, the prop blades have less air to push against, right? So the pilot operating handbook for my plane, it tells me the maximum operating altitude is 17,500 feet, where the engine is just not able to push enough air out of the way to keep climbing. And that number is probably with a single occupant with a very light fuel load. Now, this aircraft does have a big brother called the SR-22 with a more powerful turbocharged engine, which basically keeps the pressure inside the cylinders higher. So that will reach 25,000 feet. And then there's crazy things like the Lancer Evolution, which uh, Austin from X-Plane talks about all the time. That has a turbine engine and a pressurized cabin, and it could, I think, go to 33,000 feet, except that the FAA rules limit it to 28,000. And if you rewind to 1938, there's an Italian aviator called Mario Pizzi who reached 56,000 feet in a Caproni C-161, a single-engine, piston-powered biplane. He had to wear an early pressure suit for this, and the record still stands today with the only, only a couple of other multi-prop designs even going higher than this. So jet engines, on the other hand, they operate on a slightly different principle. They compress the air, they burn it, and then they exhaust the fast-moving air ga exhaust gases out the back. But they still lose performance if they can't get enough air through the intake at the front. Jet engines tend to be more powerful and they can operate at higher speeds without losing thrust, like the propellers do. But generally, the passenger jets that we all fly on, they are all cruising around 40,000 feet. And those altitudes generally aren't chosen at the limits of the performance of the aircraft. They're actually chosen based upon the most efficient cruise configuration because, of course, you know, the cost to fly is the, the driving factor. Private jets, they tend to go higher, in some cases above 50,000 feet, because they're carrying people who are more concerned with their time and less concerned with the cost. There's usually a limit imposed on these passenger planes by things like uh, the ability to maintain cabin pressure at a low enough you know, altitude, and also the time to get back down to safe levels if they have a pressure loss. But you know, beyond this, there are aerodynamic limitations to be concerned with for the high-speed aircraft flying in this uh, range. So I mentioned the stall speed earlier as a lower limit for flying. Aircraft also come with upper speed limits on their speed, right? The never exceed speed is a point where the airflow over the aircraft can generate forces beyond the structural strength of the vehicle. For the Cirrus, I think it's 201 knots, and that puts limits on how quickly, say, you could descend from a high, high altitude if you've got an emergency. Uh, the good news is that the structural speed of airliners generally isn't a problem because at 40,000 feet, it's actually way, way higher than their cruising speed, well into supersonics. The speed limits that airliners do have to pay attention to at cruise altitude is the Mach limit. This is the point where the aerodynamics radically change due to supersonic airflow, air being compressed and accelerated to locally supersonic speeds. This makes a shockwave which can change the lift. Uh, it can render control surfaces ineffective, and sometimes it can generate transonic aeroelastic oscillations which can damage or even destroy the aircraft. One infamous problem was known as Mach Tuck, where the elevator would become ineffective, and in fact, 
the aircraft would begin to dive and get faster and once it hit transonic speeds the elevator would stop working it would dive more and the pilots would be unable to pull up and slow down frequently before they basically hit the ground so anyway for airliners and private jets there will be a Mach meter which measures the speed relative to the speed of sound Importantly, the speed of sound depends on the temperature of the air, so it drops by about 10% by the time you get to 36,000 feet and pretty much remains constant until well above 70,000 feet. For a modern airliner, the maximum Mach operating number is usually about 0.8 to 0.9. For a Citation X private jet, the limit is Mach 0.935. If you're going for speed, you won't go any faster by heading higher, but you might save fuel or reduce engine load depending upon what your uh, you know, aircraft handbook says. So anyway, the maximum Mach speed is really critical to the U-2's maximum altitude. The U-2 was designed to fly as high as possible to evade air defences and its altitude is limited because the thin air makes the stall speed get faster and faster until it converges somewhere with the Mach limit at about 75,000 feet. And that means there is no speed which isn't both faster than the stall speed and simultaneously slower than the Mach limit. So I found these charts from a U2 and you can see the range where the pilot needs to keep the airspeed to keep it flying. And this is a restrictive corner of the flight envelope and it's affectionately known as coffin corner. Consider that if you've got a plane with a 100 foot wingspan like the U2 and you make a standard rate turn at you know, three degrees per second, then there is a three knot difference between the inside wing and the outside wing of your aircraft. And one of those could end up stalled or hitting the Mach buffet. So anyway, if you wanna make a plane go higher, it needs to either raise the maximum Mach limit or lower the stall speeds to make more room between them. So NASA's Helios aircraft was a very light solar powered flying wing that had a cruising speed of something like 30 to 40 miles per hour or kilometers per hour even, it's worse. It could take off at the speed that the average person could achieve on a bicycle. It was able to sustain level flight at above 96,000 feet during testing. The idea was that they could use an aircraft like this for things like communication satellites. Obviously, this was in the case in the times before balloons became the new hotness. Ultimately, it was destroyed by turbulence in the lower atmosphere, breaking up and falling into the Pacific. Another entry in the flying slow and very high camp is a Perlin project, which is a pressurized glider which exploits rare mountain waves which can interact with the jet stream and deliver continuous updrafts that reach up to almost over or over a hundred thousand feet. In 2018 they succeeded in flying this glider up to 76,000 feet higher than the U-2 but their goal is a hundred thousand feet and they are actually going to make another attempt later this year. So the other method of, in, of increasing your altitude is increasing the Mach limit. Well, that's actually a lot more fun. You know, that straight wing, it gets into transonic territory around Mach 0.7. And if you sweep the wing a little, like an airliner, that actually helps delay the development of shock waves over the wings. And that pushes that limit closer to Mach 1. The U2 didn't sweep its wings, by the way, because that would actually make the structure more complex, make the wings slightly longer. Uh, the U-2 was actually derived from an F-104 Starfighter and that used short stubby wings and a lot of power to push through the sound barrier. And those short stubby wings were great for going fast but they didn't lend themselves to generating high lift. And in general, the aircraft designed to go supersonic need that speed to maintain lift at their service ceiling. And that is what Concorde did of course. It would happily fly at 60,000 feet above all those other passenger planes, but also above the weather. The Concorde was a rare example, right? More commonly in this flight regime with high power, high speed swept wings is, this is the domain of the high performance military jets like the F-15 that could sustain level flight at 65,000 feet at around Mach 0.2. And that is impressive, but its altitude is still short of the more sedate U-2. The best example, of course, of the high performance, high altitude is the SR-71 Blackbird and its relatives, which would happily fly at 85,000 feet while cruising at over Mach 3. 
This holds the official altitude record for sustained flight, but it is worth noting that the A12 performance figures, which was a single seat version, they give it a service ceiling of 95,000 feet, but because it was run by the CIA, there's no public records that actually document flights at this altitude. So the limit on the SR-71 is down to the engines. As you go faster, the air getting compressed in those intakes gets hotter just due, due to ram pressure, and it will reach the point where engine damage can occur. And to go higher, you would need to go faster. So Brian Schul, who's the guy that wrote Sled Driver, he actually describes an incident where he pushed the Blackbird beyond the design limits to like Mach 3.5 to evade missiles for a short time. So higher flights may have been achievable, but again, stressing the aircraft in ways that it wasn't really designed for. And all of these are limits in level flight. There are lots of demonstrations of aircraft making zoom climbs to higher altitudes and then sort of gliding back. An aircraft will build up speed in level flight and then it will pull up into a steep climb and convert all that kinetic energy into altitude. A stripped down version of the MiG-25 was able to hit an altitude of 123,520 feet, which is the record for a jet-powered plane. This kind of manoeuvring it actually has a utility beyond simply setting records. Uh, a British English Electric Lightning with a service ceiling of 60,000 feet demonstrated the ability to zoom climb to 70,000 feet and then intercepted a U-2 flying at 66,000 feet during uh, NATO exercises. But look, if you care about altitude and not endurance, then rocket planes can go higher. And since they benefit from not actually having to push against air to, for their engines, the X-15 dropped from a B-52, it made it to space, and it held the record until 2003 when Spaceship One uh, went slightly higher. But look, at this point, we've probably stretched the definition too far into territory where the answers aren't interesting anymore. A vehicle with enough thrust and delta V need not concern itself with the dirty air once it reaches orbit. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.